Tim Jennison is with me here today to talk about the documentary that is coming out with him in it and a number of other things. Tim, thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me. So Tim, we'll look at the documentary first. Tim's Vermeer uh, essentially is a documentary about you replicating Vermeer portraits. But what you found in, your, in this documentary, but really your studies, was that there was a component missing that many people didn't know about. What was it? Well, you know, photography was invented in about 1840, and it wasn't long after that that people started saying, hey, these photographs kind of look like Vermeers. Why is that? And there was something strange about the Vermeers. You know, they, they look like, uh, they have that photographic look. And I'm a video engineer by trade, among other things, and I'm used to looking at images on a TV screen and judging what's wrong with it. Mm. When I saw the Vermeer, I saw something that was too accurate to be painted by well, it couldn't really be seen by the human eye, what Vermeer painted, but so, he nailed it. So you're, it. Almost, you're almost saying that it, it seemed impossible that Vermeer could have done this. It seemed to me impossible to paint like Vermeer. Uh, so I reasoned that Vermeer must have not only been able to trace the shapes of things, but to trace the colors exactly. Mm. That's the way you can get that photographic look. And if you could do that, you would have a human-made photograph, a photograph that was 350 years old. And so I thought about it, and in the, in the bathtub one day, it occurred to me how he might have done it. A very, very simple, elegant way to trace the colors. Which is what? It's a, it's a simple mirror that's placed in just the right spot. And so you look through this mirror. In the mirror's reflection, you see your subject, whatever you're painting. Just past the edge of the mirror, you see your canvas. Right at the edge of the mirror, you can compare those two colors, because they're just like that like comparing two paint chips. Right. That's the basic idea, and it's, it's a little more involved than that. But by, I, had, I did a simple experiment on my kitchen table, and I had never painted, I never picked up oil paints in my life, sure. and I painted this thing that was an exact copy of this photograph that I, that I had uh, as a test, and I thought, this, wor this works way too well. So I, I started an online search. I go, surely somebody has thought of this before, and I searched, I searched, searched in different languages. Then I started ordering books about art and about Vermeer and about the golden age of Dutch art. There was nothing. But I, I thought Vermeer must have done this. So hmm. I decided to, um, to do a, a, a more effective experiment to actually paint, repaint one of Vermeer's paintings. And I did it by reconstructing his studio in full size, building all the furniture, life size, putting people in it, making this uh, uh, kind of like a movie set. And then I set up the machine as I thought Vermeer must have used, uh, used it. And, um, and uh, it took a long time. <laughs> How long did it take? Well, it took, uh, the, the whole project took about four or five years. Okay. So I feel very fortunate that I could take enough time off work and pursue this. And it was, uh, it was just uh, an amazing experience. So you were able to find something that nobody else had found, at least in the research of Vermeer. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, uh, it, if it's true, and I can't, I can't really prove it, um, all I can do is show that with this machine, I get something that looks almost exactly like a Vermeer. There is no historical evidence that he did this. But if it's mm -hmm. true, it, it does change art history. Penn and Teller worked on the documentary with you. They were narrating it. Uh, I mean, how did you come into contact uh, with them on, on this project? Well, I've known Penn and Teller for two or three decades. And <laughs> okay, uh, you right. know, they were, um, you know, just being in the television business, uh, I, a friend of a friend introduced us a long time ago. Uh, one day, after I had done this first experiment on my kitchen table, just by coincidence, uh, Penn sent me an email and he said, um, I have been doing nothing but spending time with my toddlers and I need an adult conversation. Can you please come over and talk to me? And he sounded desperate. And so I went over and he said, okay, I don't want to talk about show business. I don't want to talk about uh, politics. I don't want to talk about work or anything to do with, you know, making a show or anything like that. What do you got? And I thought for a minute, and I said, well, what do you know about Vermeer? He said, the painter. I said, yeah. He said, not, not much. I, I know what they look like. I, I've, I went to a show in New York where there were a bunch of Vermeers. 
he painted very, you know, photographically. And I said, well, I think I figured out how he did it. And he said, what? And I happened to have um, my, my little snapshot camera on my belt, and there was, a, I, there was a video on there looking down through the apparatus as I did my experiment, and I showed it to him. And he said, I totally get this. You know, being a magician, you know a lot about optics sure. and mirrors. And he said, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, you know, I'll probably make an online video and maybe write a paper or something. And he said, that is a really stupid idea. <laughs> Why is it Th stupid? This should, be, this should be a real movie. Mm. So he said, we should start pitching this. And that's, that's how the whole thing started. And it just, just kind of got the ball rolling. And, it did for, you know, we didn't think it would take long. Uh, we thought maybe it was a year project max, but it actually took uh, about four years and we finished, just finished the film like a month ago. Wow. So let's pivot away from the film and to what a lot of people know you for, which is your high-tech uh, mind. I mean, y your new tech is your company, mm -hmm. and the TriCaster was your invention. I mean, um, did you guys use a TriCaster in putting this uh, together with the film? No, we didn't <laughs> need to use the TriCaster. You know, the, this was uh, totally um, standard movie making techniques, uh, you know, just straight shooting and editing. So what the TriCaster is really good for is live television, where you've got multiple cameras set up and you're going to do switching among the cameras, maybe bring in, um, roll in some video, do titles, do transitions, um, all the things that happen on live television. Kind of like what we're doing here, yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> right. And, and, and uh, New Tech was the pioneer in doing that with computers. Um, in the early days of New Tech, we're talking like around 1990 now, when, the f when our first desktop video product came out, it was called the Video Toaster. Mm. Uh, it was the first time you could use a personal computer to do this actual live switching and, and character generation. And, um, and the computers were very, very slow compared to today's computers. So there was only so much we could do with that. And, and it was uh, quite a challenge just to get uh, television to pass through a personal computer. Mm. Today, the computers are literally thousands of times faster, and we, so we can handle multiple streams of high-resolution re high video. Sure. So what are you doing now to improve the, the TriCaster uh, technology? Well, one of the things we do is we constantly talk to the customers who know far more about what this thing needs to do than we do. Um, you know, we make a stab at it and then our customers tell us, well, you, you know, close but no cigar, you need to add this, you need to add that. Uh, so we spend a lot of time uh, revving the products to, um, to make them easier to use. Mm. And, and ultimately we want to uh, really reduce the workload so that a television show uh, can be done with a far smaller crew. Mm. You know, if you look at the control room of a typical uh, television station as they're doing a live show like a news show. There's a crowd of people in there and there's this huge array of equipment. looks like a cockpit of a space shuttle. And uh, all these people screaming at each other. And, right. and we're trying to get it down into uh, one box. And ideally one person should be able to do almost all those things. Mm. And that saves an incredible amount of money. And it's just a, a you know really compelling value proposition. How many TriCasters uh, estimate? How many TriCasters are being used right now? Oh, uh, well, we're a private company, and right. we don't really talk about numbers. It's it's tens and tens and tens of thousands uh, of uh, of TriCasters out mm. there, um, and uh, it's it's changing uh, it's changing video. And of course, the internet has um, has, uh, has created this huge demand for television programming that wasn't there in the old days of three networks. Right. Um, and um, that has, you know, just, uh, our, our business has gone exponential because of that. You're an inventor, so, you know, is there anything else on the horizon? I, I've heard uh, people mention uh, talk of you're working on some sort of drones. I mean, w what's kind of in the works? You talking about the anti-gravity boots? Maybe, maybe uh, that's what I'm not, I'm oh, not sure. Well, sure. <laughs> Tell us um, about some anti-gravity boots. No, we're, we're not working on drones <laughs> or anti-gravity boots, ah. but, but uh, clearly um, uh, we see this whole thing evolving. More and more things are going into the computer network. Mm. Uh, so we are, uh, I, I, I'm, if, uh, just a general direction, uh, is uh, that more and more things are happening in the cloud, if you will, or uh, on the network. And there is less and less um, 
you know, like I'm looking here at your cameras, they have video cables coming out of them and all these video cables and there's miles and miles, literally, of video cable in a typical television station. Yeah. And we see all of that going away. And, you know, because computer technology is so cheap uh, compared to all this dedicated, what we call big iron. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to drive that as far as you can drive it and, and, and uh, make it cheaper and easier to use. Your bio says you at one point were in a rock band. Yes, for about four or five years. You know, uh, in high school, I thought the perfect job would be to ride around the country in a school bus with a bunch of guys and play music every night. And, um, you know, it was a fantasy. It, it sounded like the perfect job to me, and <laughs> I tried it. And it does get old, believe it or not. So, But all the time I was uh, a rock musician, uh, I was... Uh, uh, pursuing my electronic hobby and uh, educating myself about uh, electronics and the brand new world of microcomputers hmm. that were just hitting the scene back in the late 70s. So uh, what instrument were you? You were guitar? I'm a keyboard player. Uh, yeah. Oh, your keyboard? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I would haul this real piano with me wherever I went. You know, some people would haul a Hammond organ. They're both really, really heavy. and Guitar players have it so easy, you know, let's just pick it up and take it along. Yeah, it's interesting to hear some of these other keyboardists, you know, artists who, you know, lug their massive Steinway Grand, you know, mm. in, a, in a van all over the country. Mm. But uh, let's return to once more in the TriCaster. I mean, what, what's kind of the, what's one of the bigger things you're, uh, biggest troubles you're facing right now with the TriCaster? Is it trying to size it down? Well, the challenge that we have is that doing video production with a computer is about the hardest thing you can do with a computer just because of the sheer amount of data flowing through. Uh, I mean, computers are fast, but when you consider a high-def stream of video, uh, you can't, you know, it's, it's right at the limit of the computer. We can, we can accept eight high-def cameras into the system right now. And even though Moore's law keeps driving up the speed of computers, we are, f we are right up against that limit all the time. And that is our challenge. So we are trying to figure out ways around Moore's law and go faster than Moore's law because our customers want more. So it's, uh, that's the challenge that we have. The computers are just, you know, they've kind of slowed down. Well, Tim Jennison, uh, from documentary to inventor to I didn't expect to speak of Moore's Law today, but thanks so much. <laughs> thanks for having me. It's been great here, being here. For The Street, I'm Joe Dell.